This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. The long-awaited reunion of science and spirit has arrived at last. Any reasonable review of the scientific literature of the 21st century firmly establishes the existence of life after death. So why isn't this common knowledge? Simply because the current science versus spirituality debate reflects the science of the 19th century, debating the spirituality of the 18th century. Recent advances in end-of-life research, neuroscience, physics, and understanding of spiritual neuroanatomy and experimental research done at diverse locations, including Seattle Children's Hospital and the National Warfare Institute, clearly provide irrefutable evidence for the existence of life after death. It is said that dramatic claims demand dramatic evidence. That evidence currently exists. Dr. Melvin L. Morris is a pediatrician who did the first gold standard research documenting that children as they are dying see an entity they call God and feel that they are leaving their physical bodies. As one young girl told me reassuringly, you'll see Dr. Morris, heaven is fun. I published this research in the AMA Pediatric Journals. We convincingly documented that the near-death experience is real and not the result of a lack of oxygen to the brain or a byproduct of the many medications given dying children. Valeria Tellis interviews Dr. Melvin L. Morris, the author of Where God Lives, The Science of the Paranormal and How Our Brains Are Linked to the Universe. Melvin L. Morris, MD, is an acclaimed pediatrician, voted one of America's best doctors, and author of books on near-death experiences and the spirituality of death and dying. He was described by NBC News as doing more than any other scientist to prove the existence of life after death. He was an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington for 20 years. His international bestseller, Closer to the Light, describes the near-death experiences of children. This was based on his studies at Seattle Children's Hospital under the supervision of the University of Washington's Human Subject Review Board. Meet Dr. Melvin at melvinmorrismd.com and melvinmorris.net. Here is the interview with Dr. Melvin L. Morris. In your own words, who is Dr. Melvin L. Morris? I'm a uh, now retired uh, pediatrician, but not retired neuroscientist, who have studied the question of uh, near-death experiences for well over 20 years. And I was inspired by a young man who told me of his near-death experience after we had resuscitated him from being underwater for 45 minutes. And he said to me, I think he asked the the question that I see on Facebook all the time, but was it real, Dr. Morse? Because if it was real, then you have to tell all the old people. And uh, ever since uh, I had that interview with him, that has been uh, my mission. Is uh, and and I've really taken the scientist's view of let the chips fall where they may. If they are not real, if they're fantasies of the mind, if uh, then uh, then the old people need to know that. And uh, the grieving parents, 
If these experiences are not real, then they need to, you know, they're my worst, uh, not worst, but they're my most interrogating critics because it's of utmost importance to them, you know, whether their shared dying experience was real or not. And I have an obligation to tell them, well, you know, yes, it's real or no, uh, my research has shown that it's not real. So that that's, yep, yeah, that's who I am. I'm, I'm, I want to know the answer to that question too. My next warm-up question for you, it's an open question about life itself. What is life? What is this here happening? And what is the purpose of the human experience, if there is one? Okay. So, uh, you know, Valeria, um, it's clear. I can give you a scientific, in the year 2021, a scientific answer to your question. We now know. The answer to your question is that we are here to learn highly specialized lessons of love. There, there simply is no doubt about it. Well, why can I be so certain? Because near-death experiences, turns out, are real. And the message of the near-death experience is unmistakable, that we are here on this invented uh, reality specifically to learn highly specific lessons of love. And uh, I had a one uh, a young man uh, who told me uh, this, and he said to me, it's kind of like we're being given a final exam, but they don't tell us what the questions are, because if, if they told us what the questions are, then we would be <laughs> trying to cheat. <laughs> and so I can tell you that, that everything that you think is uh, what is important in your life probably isn't. That resonates in the sense of this feeling that life is unconditional love. I actually include the word unconditional before love, which kind of makes sense. If this is unconditional love, this happening here, this, um, you called it invented, or this, this reality, or whatever that this well, seems uh, let to me be. just quickly get past it so people don't think that's some kind of you know uh, uh, new age psychosocial baloney. Uh, that actually isn't correct. Um, we uh, take all of the impulses from the electromagnetic field that surrounds us. We sample it with our electromagnetic uh, 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 sensors of our body, you know, our eyes, our, uh, you know, our sensors uh, that detect pressure and touch, etc. And then in our brain, we create this reality. So this reality, I'm telling that this is just neuroscience 101. This uh, this reality actually is created. We do not see anything with our eyes. In fact, we sample the universe and um, then we create the vision that we think of. So our eyes are not video cameras, in other words. It's another point that makes sense to me, resonates, because I do think that we are the universe. No getting around it. <laughs> no, no. Now you're talking physics 101. How, how, <laughs> Valeria, you know, I've been, I've been like going to your website and I've been listening to your blogs. I didn't know that you were both a neuroscientist and a, uh, uh, you know, a theoretical physicist. That, that actually is correct. Uh, the, the world, uh, you know, so when we ask what is real, we have to, of course, turn to the masters of reality, the theoretical physicists. And they tell us that what is real is a gigantic electromagnetic force field in which time and place do not exist. That that's, comes from Einstein uh, and his students. Uh, so, so you're right. Uh, so, so obviously, like, but let me flesh this out a bit. So people always tell me, well, I, I left my body. Well, that's true from a metaphorical stance, and that's true from something that I guess we can understand. But of course, we don't leave our body because our body is embedded in the universe. There's no, there's no body to leave. There's no, there's no place to go. I mean, it's they're all just one electromagnetic field. We're we're a, we're a color in a in a fabric. I, I think that's the best way to see it. Like we're like this gigantic tapestry, and we're one of the threads. Yeah, I have read a lot about neuroscience and all the latest studies and, of course, uh, non-dual teachings. When everything comes together, it seems like we are talking about the same thing. The highest uh, spiritual teachings and scientific research is on what we are, not even who we are, but what. Oh, that's why all the theoretical physicists are uh, writing uh, spiritual novels in their spare time. And, and one axiom, uh, you know, one absolute truth about theoretical physics 
is that what they learn can't be expressed in words. Uh, does that sound a little mm. from the spiritual? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> that's, why, that's why they have to write it in mathematics. Uh, they do not have words. You know, as uh, one of the great uh, physicists said, uh, if you think you understand theoretical physics, that in itself means you don't. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And that's exactly how, yeah, in spiritual teachings, that's if you think you know what or who you are, then if you're using words to describe that enlightenment or um, getting to this nirvana, whatever it is, then yeah, you're not there. It cannot be experienced. So um, that's the question that I usually ask most of my guests um, when we talk about these topics specifically. What is there beyond experience? It seems like this is the unknown, right? Melvin, this, we are actually living the unknown. We can't really experience what this really, really is. Well, here's the best I can answer that question. What what an amazing question! Um, in 20 years, I can tell you, I've never been. I've been. I've been on Oprah. I've been on. <laughs> I've been on Larry King. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Here's the closest I can get to it. I once had an experience very uh, similar to uh, uh, the near death experience. And uh, I had it as a sort of a thought experiment on my part. I decided I would see what prayer was all about because I was in Salt Lake City and I met with some Mormons there and they had indicated to me that uh, they thought that uh, prayer uh, had something to do with, you know, our ability to communicate with God. That, uh, as, as you're going to ask me about the God spot later. So you know, maybe that's why we have a God spot. So I, I, I asked them how to pray because I figure they know. I mean, they do a lot of praying. And, um, but I made it as an experiment. I said, um, I want 24 hours from now to have a piece of this experience. That's what I prayed for. I didn't want to have it right away because I thought that then I might have been just talking myself into it. And then uh, I was on a book tour. So then, uh, you know, and then this, you know, it's L.A. and it's, you know, San Francisco. And, and I had already forgotten about it. And right at 24 hours, suddenly my mind went blank. And I just was in this light, this, it was like, the really, I can't describe it to you, but I, but when it happened, I thought to myself, oh, so this is the experience. And boom, just thinking that, and I was out. <laughs> so it must be that, you know, be, I don't know how, well, I was in my hotel room and I had asked for room service. So I'm going to guess it lasted perhaps 45 minutes, but certainly there was no sense of time and there was no sense of anything other than pure love. It was just, I was like, and then I had that thought. And then as soon as I had that thought, boom, <laughs> I was there in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're right back into describable, yeah. knowable experiences. Right. Right. So I, I, and, and the children, I've never, I personally have never heard of your death experience that I've heard thousands of them, and which isn't started by, well, this isn't actually what my experience was, but this is the best I could do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it seems like it's still an experience. You're not able to describe with words. There was a sense, a feeling of something happening. And it seems to me, as long as we have this feeling, this sense that something is happening, it's still not it, it's not what we call wholeness or the ultimate absolute reality. We are still able to experience something. Well, there's another clue. This experience is healing. And uh, the reason I know this, I know this personally, because again, I, you know, I, I love to hear other people's experiences, but I like to, you know, I think the gold standard is to see what happens when, you know, because a lot of stuff is, you know, as you know, is just con artist <laughs> BS. But um, I had a severe uh, cancer that had uh, metastatic lesions in my lungs. And I had heard before, I've, you know, I've heard that this experience is healing and, you know, all sorts of different anecdotes. But um, I uh, went to uh, a medium friend of mine and she does what's known as remote viewing as part of her mediumship. And remote viewing is going into this uh, indescribable uh, domain, that, you know, and they, they have a technique of doing it. And she went into that and visualized my cancerous tumors. And uh, it's been now uh, three years. And I just was up at Duke Hospital and they say I'm cancer-free now. Uh, and I 
pretty, one of the reasons I did this was I had a type of cancer uh, which there's no treatment for. Uh, it's an unusual type of thyroid cancer. And so uh, I firmly believe that it's not just an experience that you are, I mean, you must be contacting this unconditional love. Uh, you must be contacting this ultimate reality because how else could it be healing? And it is, there's no, I mean, you know, I don't want to bore you with all, you know, of course, being a, a medical scientist, you know, I got all the before and after CAT scans and, you know, asked my doctor's opinion is could this just happen spontaneously and blah, 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 you know? Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the, these, they have the potential to be healing. I, I do want to quickly add, um, I was talking to uh, my mother, uh, a mon much of my fellowship was in hematology, oncology, and uh, leukemia in children. And I talked to a mom and uh, we were talking about, you know, the power, power of prayer to heal. And she said, well, Dr. Morse, if it was that simple, uh, the cancer wards would be empty because every one of us <laughs> parents is praying like crazy. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to make, you know, I, I, I'm not making a trivial statement, Valeria, that, that somehow just prayer does it. There's more on the table than that uh, because she's right. I mean, uh, you know, everybody's praying like crazy. And yet there is also, I've documented in my own patients, uh, spontaneous cures, which can only be explained through prayer. That's why we need science, Valeria. We need to, you know, instead of this whole bit where science is perceived as being against spirituality, this should be a starting place. We should now start to look at this. Well, wait a minute. Okay, so how can we amplify that effect? You know, what are the associated factors that sometimes make prayer uh, happen and other times uh, prayer seems to not work at all? There's too much at stake uh, for this uh, foolish uh, oh, spirituality is against, uh, uh, you know, uh, science and, and blah, blah, blah. It's not. Science amplifies and augments spirituality. I truly believe that they can come together. And they do, actually. Fundamentally, it is. We are talking about the same things, spiritual teachers and, and scientists. <clears throat> but I think language gets in a way and also the way it is interpreted by most people. It makes sense to me that if everything's energy, just different forms, then anything could happen. It's free energy too, which means we might be able to manipulate it at a small contract, in a contracted way, maybe the energies of the body. But then it's so vast and it's so free that it will do anything, it will become anything. And that's why you say that sometimes it works, you know, people pray and then something happens and then some people pray and nothing happens because energy is just, it's free, isn't it? Unbounded, it's unlimited. Unbounded, I think you're right. And and we're not, you know, I've, I, I've heard medical scientists say, tell me that all energy, uh, all medicine is energy medicine, but that isn't our operating mode. And I think on the spiritual side, I think, you know, I always hear all of my new age friends are saying stuff like, well, we create our own reality. <laughs> and then a very cynical uh, tarot card reader that I know said, well, yeah, but there's a lot of us here. <laughs> so, <laughs> Many so, realities. So we're not actually creating our own reality. We're, we're creating a shared reality with, uh, you know, lots of other people. That's the mystery, isn't it? Um, that's an interesting dance, the different bodies. I mean, we see that in nature. It's so diverse. It's, it's so different. All goes back to your opening question. What is the meaning of life? And if we understand that we're here to learn highly individualistic lessons of love, well, then, I mean, just to be blunt about it, that means that grieving over a child who has died in unfair circumstances is a lesson of love for one person. And, uh, a child who is miraculously healed through prayer is a love for another person. And, uh, you know, I think that I think that there's, you know, it, that we have to is surrender to whatever, you know, who's ever giving us these lessons or, you know, wherever these lessons are coming from. Uh, I think to ultimately understand a lot of the uh, complexities that uh, you and I just touched on. 
So I do have a question for you about God. One of your books that caught my attention is titled Where God Lives, The Science of the Paranormal and How Our Brains Are Linked to the Universe. The main question that I have about God to you is what, where, and who is God to you? Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to understand I was having a little fun with, uh, you know, with, uh, with my reading audience, uh, that title. Uh, it's much like... Um, uh, my mentor, uh, uh, Raymond Moody, uh, who actually is now my uh, brother-in-law, he recently wrote a book called God is Bigger Than the Bible. And, and you know, because uh, he and I share similar views on this. The answer to your question for me is obvious because I came out of the Jewish faith. And the Jewish faith strongly believes that we cannot know what is God? That God is unknowable. So much so that the word for God in Judaism actually means I don't know. It's, uh, you know, that's, you know, and, and when you write the word God in English, you're supposed to write God dash D, you know, to take away any, uh, you know, any sense that you are really knowing who God is. So much so uh, that modern Israelis have forgotten this, but the ancient rabbis taught us that even a temple is an, is an idol. You know, that even a place of worship is an idol. Uh, and, of course, the Jewish religion uh, says there can be no idols. Uh, you know, so, so the things that all the sites in, you know, the, you know, in the near, near, in the, um, near East that they're uh, fighting over, they're fighting over idols from a Jewish, from a straightforward Jewish perspective. I, I think we have no idea of what God is. I think that the answer comes from people who've seen God. Those are people who have had near-death experiences. And these are, by and large, children and they're by and large describing God as uh, like Santa Claus or, um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, the way God would come to a child. And yet they're very clear that this is a sense of unconditional love, that this is an absolute sense of the first time in their lives that they have been unconditionally loved. They are part of the universe. Uh, I, I've had dozens of you know, people who you know haven't heard this from other people. They, you know, children have said, "Well, I wasn't in the light; I was the light." You know, so so I think that you know, straightforwardly, God uh, is uh, unconditional love, unknowable. So, well, it says in the Christian Bible that uh, everything is God, and that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Uh, it's very clear from uh, the uh, Old Testament that God created both good and evil. So all of these concepts that God is sort of <laughs> judgmental in any way are obviously wrong if God created both good and evil. Uh, so, you know, that is, is, is something, you know, he certainly isn't the bearded dude in the sky that uh, we, we keep hearing so much about. I mean, I, I had someone after a lecture said to me, well, I don't believe in God. <laughs> it's like, you know, because I was just, you know, I mean, kids just say it's God. So I just say it's God. And they, you know, well, I believe in a higher power. If you know, I don't believe in God. So, you know, I, we can't get caught up in all of that, Valeria. We have, you know, children have seen God and they're very straightforward that it was a light that had a lot of good things in it for me. <laughs> it's a loving light that, that, that the entire universe is made of. Well, Melvin, that goes back to the idea that we are the universe, that everything's energy. And it seems to me like what those experiences are showing is that we are actually getting ourselves to experience at that level what unconditional love is, what, what we call God, and that we are not able to experience while here in, in um, identification with the mind and the rational mind. Most of us can't really be in touch with that. So it seems like, because it has been my experience too, when becoming less rational than the sense of uh, union, the sense of wholeness kind of sets in and it's just really freeing, it's liberating in that sense. Yeah. There's a great uh, book by Thornton Wilde, uh, and uh, I've forgotten its name right now, but uh, it's about uh, uh, people who have crossed over this uh, bridge in South America, and the bridge collapsed, and uh, certain individuals are killed. And so uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the person who's writing the book um, wants to explore why them, and concludes that it's because they've learned their lessons of love. 
And so now, you know, so they had no more reason to be here. And that's my rough and ready take on it. When I, you know, I, I don't just, when I listen to someone's near-death experience, and very, I want to know who they are, how have they come to this point. And my rough and ready take on it is that it's the, uh, you know, the natural consequence of them learning lessons of love. That's a very lovely, interesting interpretation of life itself, which I hear a lot. And I, of course, it's so lovely and so seductive the, to the logical mind, of course, because we wanted to continue to exist, mind continuation. We wanted to live on as this, as the identity we believe we are. So that makes sense that the mind, the rational mind would create all these stories and this continuation for the afterlife. I do see everything connected everything. Like, um, in a way, if I take identification, I never begun. And how can I ever die if I was never born in the first place, being life itself? Right. How could you learn your lessons? And we're not, by the way, I want to immediately pivot to an, uh, a unpleasant, at least to us, side of this. So if we're saying that everything is love, then that means that bullets are love. That means that tanks are love. That means that serial killers are actually doing loving things. I mean, it's easy to, uh, you know, to what I love to call the the, the Facebook, uh, you know, uh, um, bumper stickers. Um, but it's a lot harder to get down in there and try to parse that out. And yet I just recently read a, a woman uh, who is an Iraqi war vet who had a near-death experience. And one of her uh, experiences was that, wait a minute. You know, these bullets, which are uh, penetrating my body and killing my comrades, are also made of love. If this, you know, it's, it's you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. These are these are difficult lessons of love. The uh, Tibetan monks knew this. They frequently would tell their uh, disciples, well, I'm going to come back uh, as a criminal in my next life. Because it's only in that domain that you really learn some of these lessons. You know, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, he, these are, I see what we learn from the near-death experience as harsh, uh, painful truths uh, that uh, what's happening to, well, it's, it, it's twofold. It's, it's, I've talked to many people uh, who are really uh, getting, you know, have had the harsh side of life presented to them. And I can counsel them that, yes, you're right. This is part of your destiny. But the good news is that when the final exam day comes, you're going to get a great hug from God (laughs) that tells you you're going to get an attaboy. You know, wow. You know, even if you committed suicide, even if you bailed out, uh, you're going to get a big hug from God and be told uh, that you are unconditionally loved. And maybe you're going to have to have another go at it. But it's so and, and that's why I keep coming back to the science, Valeria, because That's why, like, grieving parents know what I'm going to tell you now. They say, well, I want so desperately to believe what you're saying is true, but I don't want to because I think I'm just inventing it out of my mind. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, I I don't want to just be, you know, shortcutting myself out of my grief. And yet the research from uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, the, the the National Warfare Institute, uh, from um, uh, what we know of uh, the uh, of neuroanatomy, uh, as well as um, dozens of uh, well documented clinical studies, shows that near death experiences are real, and then in turn, all of these other things must be real too. They they simply you know the, so when they tell us that uh, the that we're here to learn lessons of love. We know that that because we know they had a real experience when they were dying. They got it right from God, whatever this God is. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll just quickly shoot at you one study, which I think most people are unaware of, uh, because, see, it takes a generalist like me to have come to these conclusions because each person is so into their subspecialty that they don't see everything else. But um, in the National Warfare Institute, they wanted to know how much uh, acceleration force could pilots take uh, before they would black out. And they did this for a very prosaic reason. Uh, they don't want to uh, their pilots, uh, uh, you know, crashing uh, $15 million jets. 
so they're not spiritualists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet uh, they have an experimental study which cleanly proves that near-death experiences are real. And as the head researcher uh, who published this in one of the uh, aeronautics magazines uh, pointed out, he said, we have the only experience of taking people to the point of death and then being able to interview them as to what happened. And sure enough, they have the exact same experiences as my children uh, at um, uh, uh, Seattle Children's Hospital, the the University of Washington. Uh, They uh, black out, they become unconscious, their brain stops working, they throw up, they have seizures, and then at the point of death, at the point of death, Valeria, consciousness returns. And what do they have? They have the experience of light. They think that they're sitting on a beautiful beach and having the most wonderful experience of their lives. They um, uh, think that they're out of their physical body, which we talked to before, you know, it's just a metaphor. But um, and they have the same transformation. Uh, I interviewed many of his um, uh, pilots uh, who went through the centrifuge. And sure enough, one of them who was uh, on course uh, to uh, go uh, into the Naval uh, Defense Academy, uh, highest counterintelligence programs, uh, immediately quit the Navy (laughs) and uh, became a family therapist, Um, you know, because he he said he learned something from uh, his time in the centrifuge. So, uh, you know, the exact same, you know, he's able to uh, create the near-death experience in experimental conditions, and it's precisely the same as what uh, we hear from, let's face it, less than scientific studies of, uh, I mean, we there's only so much we can do in studying somebody who reports a near-death experience after the fact. It goes back to the knowledge, right, wanting to know. And I really wonder if it's, Possible. It seems like the impossible, really, that humans can one day realize, not understand, that life is the unknown, that this is a miracle to be in a human body. And it is unconditional love as a gift. That's why maybe so many spiritual teachings, they talk about the present moment to be here. Just stay here, be here, don't be anywhere, imagining or creating stories or going by belief systems, because this, to be in a human body is a gift. But that is happening, and that's the cool thing. In, in this in this show, I'm going to just go over the history of meditation really quick because it shows the amazing dynamic. So meditation came from the to the West because Chinese the Chinese uh, communist government invaded Tibet and destroyed the monasteries. So out of a clearly brutal and evil act in which they ruthlessly, I mean, you know, these are people that meditate all day long. I mean, come on. I mean, what, what's the point of uh, destroying their monasteries? And yet they did. And so then uh, in the late 70s, uh, they uh, w- uh, relocated in India, where the Dalai Lama uh, relocated uh, to uh, India. And in the late 70s, uh, many of them came uh, to this country and to Canada uh, to teach meditation. And now, um, even the you know uh, even evangelical Christians uh, recognize that meditation you know is not from the devil, <laughs> um, and you know and meditation is uh, you know now uh, well accepted uh, across uh, the United States, and that all came out of a, a seemingly brutal act, and when you have the near death experience, you suddenly see all the strands of the tapestry, and I've had many them tell me with tears in their eyes, I now understand the reason for war. Whereas I don't think, at least I don't understand the reason for war. (laughs) You know, I I mean, I I guess in being a physician, I mean, we do know that, you know, that white blood cells have to attack uh, our own body to, you know, to squirt out splinters. Um, So I guess, you know, but but, I mean, I only have that intellectual uh, thinking. But uh, people who've had the near-death experience say they understand why they're serial killers. They understand what we consider that to be evil is not, you know, and and on and on. And, uh, you know, and so I see mankind as clearly and cleanly advancing. Look at the the so-called axial age was the birth of the great religions and from about 500 to uh, 1500 uh, before Christ. And prior to that, you know, we didn't have any of these uh, 
you know, the, the spirituality of mankind was very low, at a very low state. So we, we are, we're, we're making it. We're- it's a miracle. Thank you so much for your presence on the podcast, for what you do in this human body and the healing work and the intention behind it. Thank you so much, Dr. Melvin. Oh, thank you so much. I just, this is, uh, I do this for really, you know, I wrote these books, but, you know, I really do this because this is information that I learned from children that I want to share with grieving parents. And to me, it's sacred information. Uh, I don't charge to lecture, for example. I don't, you know, uh, you know, all the money I made from my books, I just plowed into more research because I really have just one goal is to share this information with others because it came to me. Uh, and I was just sort of, you know, I was lucky enough to be uh, able to listen. So thank you so much. I do have a few more questions for you. The ending questions. Yeah. Would you like to add anything else or read a passage in one of your books? No, that's actually what I just told you was what I wanted to add. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, so that, that was the end. This is sacred information. <laughs> I, I think that um, I, I really, I, I really, uh, and it, there's really only one reason is that I think about it as a critical care physician trained at Johns Hopkins, hardly the hotbed of spirituality. And I mean, we thought that family practice doctors were heathens, um, you know, and, you know, and I, I was good at it. I was, uh, you know, my whole life was inserting a lines uh, and I just, I just had, I just happened to be there when a child told me her near-death experience. And frankly, uh, she saw on my face that I obviously didn't believe her, that this is like the wackiest thing I'd ever heard. And she pats me on the hand and she says, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. <laughs> and, you know, and so I just, you know, and then I happened to be at Seattle Children's Hospital uh, and I just happened to uh, then uh, was lucky enough. Uh, we, By the way, people who don't think this is science, we did our study with the head of the Department of Neuroscience, the head of the Department of Psychiatry. I mean, all the big shots at Seattle Children's uh, worked together on this. And uh, we just happened to be there and uh, at the right time and at the right place. I don't think a study like this could be done again. And it's my responsibility to share these uh, these children's with, wisdom with people. And my last question is, what is another word for life? Wow. <laughs> uh, I think uh, it's love. Oh, of course, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's, I don't um, think you wow. can. I think I was trying to think of it from a scientific perspective. That, that's that's the case. It's love. So love, it is scientific. <laughs> well, think about it. Here's why I answered it that way. Because people who have experienced the essence of life, the people that have the near-death experience, the people who have seen what the theoretical physicists describe as an electromagnetic field, they say no. They say, sure, it's endless light, but it's also imbued with love. So that must be the answer. The answer must be that life is love. So before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Uh, I've got a uh, website. It's melvinmorsemd.com. Uh, I think that's the best one. Um, I also have a website, spiritualscientific.com. Uh, uh, that's uh, been uh, sort of discontinued because it's on a platform that's no longer supported, but it's chock full of, if anybody wants to read uh, the research on this, if anyone wants to see the science of spirituality, uh, I've done my best to put it all on that. Um, I would say uh, it's only about it's only about one year out of date, but it's pretty uh, encyclopedic. Uh, so, you know, if anybody wants to check for themselves, uh, to see, you know, is what he's saying really true? Uh, yeah, sure, it's all. I've got all the PDFs of all the uh, scientific research studies, um, or their own online links, and just go there and uh, research it for yourself. And I, I've not had anybody that has done that that hasn't uh, reached the same conclusion that I have. So one more time, I want to thank you for the message, which the main one, it's love, which resonates very much true to me, unconditional love, and for the work you do, how you do it. I love the, your enthusiasm, too, <laughs> uh, the energy that runs through you. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much, yeah. Dr. Matt. Wait, I have to add one thing real quick. <laughs> yeah. Okay, life is love, and you love to say unconditional love. 
Okay, so Valeria, that means that your brother-in-law was a heroin addict who spends all his time trying to chisel money out of you. It's you know a little bit harder to feel the old unconditional love in that situation. Uh, the the person uh, who raped you, uh, the person uh, who um, I mean, these the that is a harsh, difficult statement to say that life is love. And that's because of the ideas we have about what love is, the rational ideas, right? So many. We intellectualize even that, love. And love, life is not rational. And if you think about it, we have no idea what we're here. I have no idea <laughs> what, how we came to be here. There's no, we cannot, we cannot explain away that. Unconditional love means everything is just what it is because this is what life is. This is what freedom looks like. Everything doing what it does, the way it does it. And we have to make judgments if we're going to learn our lessons. So it's not as simple as, uh, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to love everything. Because we're here for a specific purpose, to yeah. learn lessons of love. It, that's what the interesting thing is. It goes back to their benevolence. But this is not, it's not a rational, I try not to rationalize that, but just live that truth. What I do now is just, is the body conditioned mind, body doing what it, it's doing. I have no idea why it's doing this. I could be doing something else, like you said, killing people, doing horrible things, but um, I'm not doing horrible things. But some other people are, and that's life trying to... It seems like there's a balance, something about balance that's happening, too. You see that in nature, too, uh, all the destruction. So it, it seems like it's trying to look for balance. But, yeah, we cannot explain that away either. <laughs> so we'll leave it at that. Love is something that cannot we cannot even talk about in a way. Thank you so much again, Melvin. We'll talk soon. All right. Take good so. care. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Dr. Melvin L. Morris and his work, please visit melvinmorrismd.com and melvinmorris.net. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now. <laughs>